opening it up. Uh, three minutes. I'm oh, sorry. I'm oh, sorry. Mm -hmm. What is it? Okay. Okay. Do we have participants, uh, Adrian? Oh, yeah. Uh, can I just work for one second? So, apologize. We've realized that we were muted. So, we've called the meeting to order and we've moved to public comment. If you would like to speak for items not on the agenda, now is the time to do so. Please raise your hand to be recognized and it will be limited to three minutes. We have one speaker for public comment. Okay, please. Jessica Tavar, recognized for three minutes. Welcome. Hi, good morning, everyone. Jessica Tovar, East Bay Clean Power Alliance. Um, I wanted to uplift that during the this last budget session, um, that a large amount of money, $14.75 million, was uh, pulled from the budget, which was originally talked about in the form of uh, bill credits. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I think that it was great that it was, that the item was pulled, but that money still remains unallocated and it's supposed to be uh, decided what to do with that money before the year is up. Um, so I wanted to remind folks of that. Um, also too, I think, you know, I personally was concerned that um, while the item was discussed and it was said that the bill credits would amount to a couple dollars for residential. Um, I did hear that there was several thousand slated for municipal and commercial accounts, which I think really speaks to why we need a budget that's detailed and shows exactly where this money is earmarked to and for and how it will be used. Um, so I really wanna encourage that the agency moving forward provides a detailed budget um, that really informs both the board and the community on how these surplus dollars are being spent um, within the agency. So that's one thing. And then the second thing is, again, to uplift the local development business plan and the agency commitment to investing in energy resilience and energy needs, and to really uplift that you have a unique position um, as an energy agency to really address energy solutions in a way that um, is innovative and addresses the needs of environmental justice communities. We've had a long legacy of environmental injustice and racism, and the agency has committed to doing local development solutions in the community and I think that's where this money, the additional monies need to go to make sure that we're uplifting all communities um, and alleviating the burden of pollution that both is you know, affecting our health at a local level, but also it's the same pollution that's causing climate change um, very rapidly. And so we do need investments that build the resilience so that we can weather the storm um, as we are living in several eyes of the storm right now. So clean power to the people. Thank you. Thank you. There are no further hands raised for public comment. Okay, we'll go ahead and close public comment at this time. Uh, staff, just maybe as I ask, uh, this item of local development plan and the budget and all of that, you're working on it and it's gonna come back for us to think about further or greater in the future. Yeah. So. When the budget was approved on this particular item, the there was a the fourteen million was never there was no there is no fourteen million. It was really just a question of how do we allocate surplus through a waterfall. So we have a waterfall for allocating surplus at the end of the year. The waterfall for this just closed year was sort of there was a three step waterfall essentially. So leading to the credit on the bills at the end. Right. The and the last thing was the bill credit at the end. And so this year we're going to, I think, issue Kelly, I don't know, something in the, but the next. Well, it's not done yet, but it will several, be several, around 18, 17, million, 17, 17 to 19, million. 19, 17 to 18 million dollars yes. will be allocated to customers in the form of bill credit 
per the waterfall. Mm -hmm. The direction we, you know, the, my, my understanding of the direction was we want to revisit the last step of the waterfall. So, so instead of saying we are approving a waterfall where the last tranche of dollars gets allocated to the bill credit, let's, at the mid-year point, when we're doing our sort of mid-year budget update, where we have a sense of the, um, the amount of money we, that we're going to be sort of putting through the waterfall, let's revisit whether we want to uh, continue to include this bill credit or use those funds for something else. And so that, 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 is, uh, that was the direction that we received, and so that, was, that is what we're planning to do. Um, we will be providing, I think, once the audit is complete, an mm -hmm. informational item to the board just to sort of explain, this is what the bill credit for last year is going to look like, and this is when the bill credits are going to be issued. And then our, um, and then probably at that point also provide some sense of, all right, this is when we have, this is when we're going to have a clear sense of what we think the sort of the full sort of budget picture for this year will look like. Generally, it's in January or February when we provide right, that update. Day. And at that point, we would say, this is a great time to sort of talk about, do we want to shift from this bill crediting strategy to you know, allocating those dollars to something else? It could be more money into local development. It could be kind of a variety of options. And you know, we'll kind of weigh what those options are. Okay. Uh, any comment? It's open public comment, so I don't want to take the item specifically, but uh... Okay, so with that, we'll move on. I'll probably have a do it in matters initiated. So uh, approval of the minutes from June 7th and October 4th are presented to us. Uh, June 7th, we get brought back just because of the noticing challenges we had. So did uh, do we have a motion for approval of the minutes or any changes or updates by anyone? Uh, one correction on the last page of the second set of minutes, the most recent ones. Uh, Chair Balch, you were listed as commenting on behalf of Pleasanton and on behalf of Oakland, so I think we need to <laughs> make that as member Cal, but otherwise looks good, and I'll move approval. I'll with, second. With the uh, amendment or correction. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you. Motion made and seconded. All in favor? Roll call vote. Great, thank you. Albany? Yes. Uh, Dublin, Oakland. Al uh, Alameda County? Yes. Pleasanton? Yes, aye. Yes, sir. Okay, moving on to item number four, AVA Solar Billing Plan Proposal. It's an informational item, uh, discussion about AVA Solar Billing Plan Proposal overall, and welcome. And maybe we could have you introduce people, because I Yeah, absolutely. So I'll, I'll let me introduce them. Uh, there's a kind of, um, Kelly will be giving a preamble, or will be giving it, but I want to give a quick preamble. So this is um, Kelly. Kelly is our, um, leads all of our account services work. So billing operations, Customer service, um, and then Doug and Jen are on our technology analytics team and are our um, this quantitative analysis uh, brain trust. Um, so we're going to be talking about a lot of specificity here around the sort of mechanics of what a net, kind of implement, implementing net billing tariff, or more commonly known as NEM three, looks like. Um, but before we get into that, I think you know there is always the option for us to not implement net energy metering three and to sort of continue doing what we're currently doing. Um, the challenge I think we have, we observe there is, is is a couple. One, it's there are some customer confusion issues that you will run into when PG&E PG is implementing net energy metering three on their portion of the bill. Their portion of the bill is today roughly. 60% of the bill. We're, we, we account for roughly 40% of the bill. The pg e portion of the bill is, is rising faster than our portion of the bill. So I think currently there's a proposal in front of the state that would result in a roughly 20% increase in the total bill. And that is just pg e charges. Those are not the generation charges. <coughs> so we're moving towards a world where our charges could be more like 30% of the customer bill and set PG&E's charges are going to be 70% of, of the customer bill. So if you think about the customer, when the customer invests in putting solar on their roof, 
they're not they're not thinking. Oh, I'm gonna try to offset just the EVC, uh, the Ava Community Energy bill or the the PG. They're looking at the totality of their bill, two hundred fifty dollars a month or whatever it is, saying, all right, can I reduce my bill if I invest twenty five thousand dollars over the next twenty years? Am I going to have a return on investment there? And so that gets you to this dynamic where. PG&E has a certain crediting mechanism that covers 60-70% of the bill and we are doing something totally different. The customer is really going to be orienting towards what the PG&E side of the bill is doing. So when they think about designing their system or how the battery is going to operate, the battery is going to be chasing value, the values that the PG&E side of the bill tells it to chase because it's a bigger portion of the bill and less so ours. We will just sort of be a follow-on. Um, and so with that in mind, and, and also because some feedback we've gotten, it's not everyone, but some feedback we've gotten from solar installers is they are, they are concerned about different CCAs going different directions, right? When they're trying to sell this, sell solar, it's a really, it's a kitchen table conversation where you're not going into like the complexities of this part of the bill. It's really, here's how much it costs, here's how much you save, and, um, there, there's been concerns expressed to us that, well, if AVA, it looks different than MCE, it looks different than PG&E, it's going to be hard for us to, ex to ex explain. So I think where we're, we're, we're coming to, I think, as an initial recommendation is, let's move, even though we have opposed net energy metering 3.0, sort of in the regulatory proceedings, and we still think it's not a good idea, this is where we are. And so is it better for us to just uh, provide continuity between what we're doing and pg and doing, and then use sort of the tools that we have that, uh, that Kelly's going to get into of providing higher bill credits and probably more significantly um, meaningful uh, payments, monthly payments, capacity payments for batteries to incentivize more local solar development and really try to think about our the budget that we have for these credits and these payments as what how much would we spend or how much would we give the customer if they were still on net metering 2.0 and we'll get to this a little bit let's say that was six hundred dollars a year and under NEM 3 it's only four hundred dollars a year well now we have a two hundred dollar budget for these higher credits and these capacity payments. We still want to deliver the customer the same amount of value they would have gotten under the net them too. But let's do it in a way that's going to make it easier for customers to understand it and make the purchase decision. So that's a little bit of a preamble for okay. uh, Kelly to jump in. Welcome. Great, thanks. Great. Right. Anyone want to pull up the slides for us? Thanks so much. All right, uh, good morning, um, board executive uh, committee, board members, members of the public on the line, um, Ava Community Energy staff. Thanks so much for the great introduction, Nick. Um, as Nick said, I'm Kelly Bresbeck, Director of Account Services. I'm here with um, the modeling team. Um, Jim, uh, Ron, uh, in particular, was really integral in uh, coming together with these slides. Um, and as Nick said, we'll be discussing our policy proposal for solar billing plan. Next slide, please. So um, we'll go over a quick introduction, a little reminder, um, just tagging on to a little bit about what Nick just described. Um, I'll describe a little in a little bit more detail the base plan. That's what's offered by PG&E. I see this as sort of the minimum of what, AB, uh, what Ava would offer. Our proposed solar billing plan, we'll discuss some fiscal impacts and then review our recommendation and get your comments. All right, so a quick um, introduction. Solar billing plan is, as Nick said, um, has also historically been known as NEM 3.0 or net billing tariff. Solar billing plan is sort of the customer-facing name that PG&E and the other investor-owned utilities are using. In order to reduce confusion, we're trying to use the same terminology. So you'll see some new words sp sprinkled into, um, into the um, presentation here. Stop me if you have any questions if I haven't defined something for you because these are these are all new terms for all of us. Um, it is the successor um, to NEM 2.0 rather than 
paying customers a retail rate for energy that they're exporting to the grid, the compensation rate is now at a new rate called the energy export credit. This really values those exports at the rate that sort of they are um, according to the grid. So these rates value by the hour and the month. So there's a big matrix that basically says for every month and every hour within that month, here's how much energy is worth. So a kilowatt hour in, let's think back to where we, when we've had those heat events in September and those late evenings where it's been like, hey, everyone can t curtail your energy use. Those kilowatt hours are exported to the grid at a much higher value than, say, middle of the day in May, the energy prices can sometimes even dip negative. So that's, um, so those, that's the EEC rates, sort of in a nutshell. That's how customers are compensated for their energy um, that they're exporting to the grid. Um, and as I just mentioned, we're now paying customers a unique value for, for values that they're exporting to the grid, which means that now, starting with um, solar billing plan, Ava Community Energy will start to receive two channels of information from PG&E. That means that we're going to start to receive information on energy exports, as well as the regular metered information that we're used to seeing that says how much the energy, energy the customer is consuming. This is a really complicated and a new change for us, as well as for PG&E. PG&E is still working on their billing system for this. They expect that residential customers, they'll be able to start billing on this tariff starting in middle of December. Residential, uh, non-residential customers, they'll be able to start billing next July. So in the meantime, all customers that would be eligible for solar billing plan are getting billed on NEM 2.0. Um, but who are those eligible customers? So the eligible customers are, um, today it's mostly customers that are transitioning. They've already spent a full 20 years on NEM 1.0, um, and now they're getting transitioned over to solar billing plan. There are also some customers that only recently <coughs> signed their interconnection agreements. Um, those customers that signed, that have their completed interconnection agreements done after April of 2023 will be transitioning to this new tariff. <coughs> so I mentioned um, earlier, you know, this is, this is a tariff that was developed um, by the CPUC, adopted by the investor-owned utilities. Um, and it also comes with what the CPC is calling a glide path. This is an adder system on top of, or a bonus system, on top of that energy export credit to help with the transition from, um, to the solar billing plan. The recipients of this glide path adder are just residential voluntary installations. So I say voluntary specifically because new residential construction in California is mandated to have solar. So those customers would not be eligible for this glide path. Non-residential customers also not eligible for this glide path. The glide path is a value that's provided for, for nine years. It's flat, it's added on top of the energy export credit, and it's vintaged. So for it incentivizes essentially customers to install sooner. So the 2023 vintage adder is 2.2 cents for residential, uh, 9 cents for residential low income customers. And then those values decrease 20% every year until in 2028, new installs don't get this glide path adder. Uh, we can go to the next slide. <clears throat> so that's the, that was the uh, sort of IOU version that's where, I, as I said, I see that as sort of the base of what AVA would offer. However, um, we're looking to do something better for our customers, including um, three main differences that we'll discuss in the next slides. The first one, um, Nick already started to highlight a little bit, and that is a capacity-based battery storage program. So, so solar billing plan really lends itself to paired solar plus storage. And that's because what that means is a customer, rather than exporting that excess energy that they're generating in the middle of the day, when energy isn't really worth that much to anyone um, on the grid, they can soak up that extra energy and then use that energy themselves in the evening, thus getting essentially a retail value for that kilowatt hour that they had already generated. 
This then saves customers money because they are able to limit their excess imports. And then it also means that they're not buying energy when it's most expensive. And also has the potential to help the rest of AVA customers by, with peak load management. We really like to help our customers with these battery installations. It's really good for everyone. It's good for the customer that's installing and also good for AVA because as we said, we could help this with, we could use this towards peak load management. We're looking at exploring program opportunities to make these ongoing payments such that customers are able to, when customers are able to use their battery in such a way that is benefit, beneficial to everyone. So that means scheduling their battery use when, um, when, it's, when it's time during our peak, and then flex based on when we see load changes on our system. We could see this um, also as a potential successor to the Resilient Home program that some customers are participating in today. Customers today also get sort of ongoing capacity based. By capacity based, I mean how big is the battery? So a larger battery will get a larger payment. Um, customers then, val then receive value from both that act active battery management, right? As Nick said, the battery is out there seeking like when is the best time to release um, to release my energy so that my customer, my owner, sort of, um, if we're, <laughs> that they can actually get the most value. Um, and then also those capacity-based payments from AVA Community Energy. I, just one additional point, I think, just really highlighting here is in the end, the goal really is to say, we want batteries that are operating, actively reducing use of natural gas, actively, you know, pushing solar energy into the times that it's most useful. So the, the rationale for a capacity payment that's paid out over time, as opposed to up front, is you pay it up front. Um, somebody said, great, I'm going to give you $1,000, $2,000. And then that person might decide, you know what, I'm just going to use this battery for backup power. That does nothing. That doesn't help the grid. That doesn't help. Um, that doesn't reduce greenhouse gas emissions, per se. And so we really want to tie this, uh, these incentives, these, these payments, to you know, achieving the goals, benefits for all of our customers. And so that's, I think, kind of a, that's a sort of underlying sort of approach that we really want to drive forward when we think about peak load management. Can, can I ask maybe another clarifying question? So, so I, I'm a NEM1 guy, mm -hmm. uh, no battery, right? So, so I apologize, I know you're not complete with the slides, but just for clarifying. Mm -hmm. So are the batteries smart enough? Are they true smart batteries that, that AVA can dictate when they're doing it? Or do we see it because of consumption and usage and-, and so, so, so yes, the batteries can be smart enough that you can tell them to what, when, what to do. I don't know that- AVA's that, dictating that. And we, we could do that. And we might say, hey, we have a higher level of payment if we have that granular level of control. But the reality is what we really just want to know is we want them connected to our system to know that they're working so that we're paying for performance. And across an average, you know, tens of thousands of households, we probably don't need to have that direct control. Like, do this now. Don't do this now. Do this now. Because the coincidence of when we, our peak is, okay. hey, from 4 p.m., 5 p.m., 6 p.m., the coincidence of that to what the value for the customer and the energy prices are high is close enough that we may just want to know, we want you connected to our system so that we can monitor that you're, it's, you're doing the thing that you're doing. And maybe in certain very emergency situations, we say, hey, there's a grid emergency. We really need these batteries sort of at the ready for the grid emergency. But I think day to day, we're not going to have to control like, <clears throat> You know, like we're not going to have people here with dials being like, dial up, dial down, <laughs> dial up, dial down. That might be like, that's a level of um, control that we probably won't need. Um, but we do want, you know, we, we want the handshake to be established. We want this API between the battery and our system to sort of be established so that we know that the batteries are there so that we can ensure that they are providing the value. Just to get any credit, though. Just to get any. So and then this how particular we, capacity payment would be tied to your battery has to, the way we're looking at it is handshake. establish the handshake. Mm -hmm. And then every month we're going to look back and see, did the battery operate? 
And as long as it operated to some, you know, minimum 70% of its, its two kilowatts, as long as you're getting at least one and a half kilowatts of the battery operating, you get you, paid. Your payment. Okay. I, well, I also think your question really speaks to the last bullet, which is program proposal expected in Q1, Q2 of 2024 yeah. is to really figure out the technical feasibility aspects as well as evaluating the customer experience aspects of. Right. But the point because we're not trying to make this so complex that it's going to be hard for the solar industry to comply. We're trying to figure out a, there's some minimum things that we want to see in there to make sure that it is achieving our load management goals. Uh, but we also want it to be easy for, well, easy for the consumer to understand. And, and I know, apologize because we're not in the full question mark, but part of my also, I, I'm a little concerned we're also over, over promising the capabilities AVA Community Energy may have that we can be, you know, the Tesla type of element, right? And I and that's I think that's the point. We're not going to overpromise. We're just going to say you want the twenty dollars or thirty dollars a month. The battery has to be enrolled. Yeah. And we're just going to watch it and make sure that it's doing the things that it's supposed to be doing. And if it's not, that might affect whether or not you get that thirty dollars that month or not. Okay. Sorry to interrupt you. Go ahead. Yeah. Any other questions while we're here? Paused or okay. Thank you. And yeah, as um, yes, as Howard just said, um, we will be returning um, early next year, you know, first half of next year, with a full program proposal. So, thanks, Adrian. <coughs> All right. In addition to that um, capacity-based um, ongoing payment for our battery storage customers, we do also propose additional adders um, for our um, non-battery um, and battery customers. So this, the recipients here, you remember um, a couple slides back, we discussed the um, bonus structure that the CPUC had recommended that had a very narrow applicability. Here we're looking at these adders being available to all solar billing plan customers. Um, we're looking at a residential, uh, CareFera, those are our low income customers. Um, those customers would be receiving about one, uh, would be receiving an additional penny per kilowatt hour export and for all exports all during all hours of the day. And then our non care fair residential customers, as well as, well as our non residential customers, would see an extra 2.5 cents per kilowatt hour for exports during AVA's <coughs> peak. Right? So, like the battery program, we're looking at encouraging exports when they're most valuable to all AVA customers. So an extra two and a half cents um, during 3 to 8 p.m. This is a little different than the 4 to 9 p.m. that we are typically saying, reduce the energy use from 4 to 9. That's when sort of the overall peak is. That's when PG&E sees their peak. AVA, our peak starts at 3 p.m. So we're starting this that's really custom, customized to our, um, to our load. All right, and if we go to the next slide. So those adders would be in effect for five years. Um, we would see this in place through the end of 2028 with those flat that flat adder system. Um, we'll be using this time, as I said earlier, this is a new rate for everybody. So we're going to be able to start to analyze those two channels of data that we're going to see, as well as what, um, what solar billing plan is doing to installation patterns, including size of system, how much um, battery connectivity we're seeing, how are these time of use rates, this new, these new rates, how are they affecting overall energy use patterns? What are behavior, what behaviors are changing? Are we seeing more electrification? We hope, you know, that, that's the intention. Well, let's use this next five years with the adders that we're proposing to really establish some baselines for with this new scheme with, um, with the rates and these new tariffs. And on the next slide, we'll look at what this looks like for our average residential customer. So here we're just looking at average residential customer. I can't really model for you, um, you know, commercial customers since their use and solar size varies too widely, but for our average residential customer, um, the two, uh, the new voluntary installation, remember those are the customers that would receive that bonus structure from PG&E and from AVA. And our two columns on the right, those are the transitioning customers or you know, your required installs. So we could think of the customers over on the left, we have our CareFera customers, they're seeing that their um, the average rate, 
the ever, average annual credits for their exports is about 505 with AVA compared to 481 with, um, with just sort of the base plan. We see those same customers see an extra $40 if they were transitioning from them one or two. And our, our non-Care Fair customers see about an extra $20 due to the Adder program. Next slide, we can see year upon year what this means for AVA. If we look at the base solar billing plan, again, that's sort of what I see as like, this is the minimum of what AVA would, do, would implement versus the solar billing plan plus the AVA Adder. And we see here that we are, <coughs> paying customers um, additional credits to the tune of when we look out to the um, eight year, or excuse me, to the five end of the five years, we see about an extra $8 million in total adders provided to our customers. Um, again, this is, I'm looking, I'm breaking this up into CareFera and non-CareFera. These values are based on customers that we know are transitioning from NEM1 and NEM2 plus some assumed growth and you know, regular growth due to new residential um, building, because we know that those customers need to have um, solar, <coughs> as well as just some um, estimated general growth in the non-residential and residential solar installs. So that's our total, um, sort of what it would cost AVA in addition to sort of the base is about $8 million over five years. So going on to our last slide, we see um, so our recommendations, the summer, our recommendations here. First, um, as we discussed, we will be returning back um, in Q1, Q2 of next year with a proposal for that battery storage incentive program. And then also, I propose that we add um, the AVA adders. Um, these would be adders onto the energy export credit of one penny per kilowatt hour for CareFera customers, and then 2.5 cents for non-CareFera customers, um, but only between the hours of 3 and 8 p.m. in order to encourage exports during our peak. Thanks, Tim. Okay, Kelly. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Uh, so why don't we go to public comment, and then we'll bring it back. So uh, with that, uh, Adrian, do we have anyone on the... In the public that would like to speak, please raise your hand at this time and be recognized for three minutes. We have one public comment, uh, two uh, speakers. Jessica Tovar, you're recognized for three minutes. Yes, um, quick comment I wanted to make is that the intent of community choice was to do better than the utilities um, to do better than PG&E and offer something better than, uh, than PG&E and the utilities. And so I wanna just uplift that because I think it's getting lost, like why we even advocated for a community choice agency. Um, and I think that that's just really important to uplift. I don't know, you know who has an issue with this agency being different or other agencies being different, the whole point of community choice was to address energy issues for their communities. And every community is different, has different needs. Um, so that's the first thing I want to uplift. Um, there are some other, some other comments from other folks that I know wanted to join this meeting, um, but the timing was just not, not how, not, um, just doesn't work. Um, and I just also just wanted to say that, you know, um, the mirroring of the net billing tariff is in, con in contradiction to the resolution that this agency passed unanimously back in 2021, opposing what the CPUC ultimately did. Incentivizing batteries is a good element of the proposal um, and should definitely be retained. And I think that there's um, other things that need to change to improve the current proposal. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Uh, Local Clean Energy Alliance, you recognize for three minutes. 
Hello, this is Elsevier Fispotter with the Local Clean Energy Alliance, and I just have a quick question on the one graphic that was describing the difference between uh, what Apple Community Energy would be paying um, solely with the base uh, solar billing plan and with the AVA adders, it was about a $9 million difference, I think, at least for the last um, category. I think that was around 2027. And I'm curious if there's a breakdown between what portion of that would be the AVA adders and what portion of that would be the capacity payments. Uh, it seems important to split those up as one kind of operates as a feed-in tariff and another one is kind of a, a, a payout for, as far as I understand it, more the... Um, peak load management. Um, so those seem to be two very different categories and it would be helpful to understand the difference or a breakdown of uh, how, how much of the funds are going towards uh, the capacity payments and how much of the funds are going to the adders. Thank you. There's no further speakers for public comment. Okay, we'll close public comment and bring it back. Um, so maybe staff, we start with uh, that clarifying question if the feed-in tariffs versus the adders. Is there anything to clarify with that? Or yeah, absolutely. So this is not a feed-in tariff. I think that's really important. So yeah. I know we're not paying a feed-in tariff here. Uh, and the, the adders are not included because, as noted, that is under development. Right. So we can't include that in what the value of the customer is because we haven't actually sort of developed the structure or um, assess of what is the dollar amount that we want to provide. I, I will say one of the things we really have been looking at is we want to maintain in line with the policy position this board is taking, supporting net M2. We want to provide equal value to the consumer. But we also need to recognize that there's a solar installs need to sell these things and it needs to be understandable to customers. And when you start, and this is I think our biggest concern, when you break them up, it actually becomes much more difficult. This is direct feedback we've gotten from multiple installers. They are very concerned that if we break it up, even though symbolically it's valuable, it becomes much harder for them to actually explain to the customer what's happening. Well, why is this NEM2 and why is this NEM3 and how do they work together? As opposed to saying, we are maintaining that value for the customer. We quantify the dollars. We basically set a budget for what, you know, we would be providing an under NEM2 versus what can just provide sort of a budget that we feel we can provide to the customer to enhance the value of NEM3 through the capacity payments, among other things. And then let's do it in a way, in consultation with the solar industry, of course, but let's actually provide a system that's going to be helpful for them to be able to go and sell this stuff. Because it's not, anything we do is only as good as the, you know, the, the ability of the industry to go and sell solar to customers. If they can't sell it, our policy doesn't work. And so I think that's something that's really important is we have consulted and we will continue to consult with the solar industry to ensure that there's alignment around whatever we bring forward as a final recommendation to this board. My expectation will be, you know, hopefully it has the very sort of strong support of the solar industry. I can't sort of guarantee that <clears throat> what exact you know where they're going to be? I can guarantee that we will have significantly engaged and with multiple sort of stakeholders in that industry who are on the ground in it, you know the Ava community, so that they feel like I understand this, and I feel like this is a best in class approach to helping us continue to go and deploy solar for for customers. Okay, uh, so it's only an informational item, so I'll bring it back to the board. Yeah, Mr. Um, Cal. Are other CCAs doing something similar to this or doing something beyond what the PUC is doing? A absolutely. So. I think this is this. I think what we're pr proposing is generally what we're seeing other CCAs do. And you know, so the best example I can point to is the Clean Power Alliance, which is the largest CCA in California that operates in Southern you know, Ventura and LA counties. They are implementing essentially what we're proposing. They have already, they, their board approved it this summer. And so they are going to be providing you know, solar billing tariff with a battery, um, a battery adder. Without the adders. Though. So they're Without actually, the adders what we're proposing would be better yeah. than what they're, because they don't actually have adders. Mm -hmm. um, I think MCE is, uh, has believe, a small adder. They, they are, 
you know, moving forward with the adder with an incentive. So this is really where we're all going. It's better value for the, the exports than what PG E provides, and some, you know, some kind of some form of sort of capacity payment incentive for batteries to help you know drive continued growth in the adoption. Okay, and who um, what what groups in the solar industry have you guys interacted with to discuss this? So we've been talking to Cal SSA, which is the state trade association, yeah. and then individual installers who are active for servicing. Okay. And, and did they make suggestions or say, oh, this sounds good, or I wish it was more, but this is all you could do, it's better I mean, nothing? Look, or? I think the fundamental issue that you keep hearing from them is they're, you know, it's a, the industry is very stressed yeah. by what's happening. And unfortunately, we can't do anything about it because 60, 70% of the bill is totally out of our control, right? So we can do a ton. But the prime driver of, of the economic value proposition of this stuff is still going to be the PG&E transmission and distribution side of the bill, and they're doing what they're doing. Yeah. So I think that's probably one of the challenges in the conversation is that they're just looking at the, and you know, we will continue to sort of advocate for sort of a return to a more um, rational system for the transmission and distribution portion of the bill, but we just can't do anything about it. Okay. Thank you. Um, to drill down on some of the basics here, the, the energy export credit, which is also in the report called the avoided cost calculation, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. can you talk a bit more about how that's calculated? Because avoided cost calculation sounds like, to me, we're paying for the avoided cost of the energy we would be buying, or is it we're compensating for them through the retail cost of the energy they are then providing to us? So I just want to... Yeah. Excuse me. The avoided cost calculation comes from it's uh, administratively determined by the CPC. Uh, it's based on a calculator um, developed by a, a consulting firm that attempts to say, you know, on average for a given month and hour, what is if we didn't have to buy that? What is the avoided cost of generating that electricity? It's the wholesale, so mm -hmm. it. it Right now, what we the credit is the retail credit. So if the retail, you know, at two p.m., the re, our retail cost for the customer is going to be anywhere from what three cents, three cents to fifteen cents, right? That's sort of the range, and that's our retail price. And so right now, at the export, you get a retail credit. What we're going towards is what is our cost? What does the cost calculator say the cost to buy energy in the wholesale market is? Mm -hmm. Uh, and that's going to typically be quite quite something lower than the retail because the retail has a whole other set of things that are added into it. Right. But it's based on the so it's based on the actual price of energy. Correct. Mm -hmm. Or a forecast of yeah. price. Yes. Of energy. But that we are avoiding buying. Correct. Because of this. Great. Thank you. Um, and then just on what you were just saying, Nick, on the what we're trying to get the pitch to be for solar. If I understand it right, it, we're trying to simplify it so that it's we're all using the same system as PG&E, but we've got all this extra gravy on top that we're doing that benefits people that then essentially puts them in the same place if we were using the other system of you know, NEM yeah. 2.0 and NEM 3.0. It just makes it easier to explain. Yeah, it, I think so. That, that yeah. is what we're trying to do. And also, yeah. so... This is where you know using the power versus the export is important to recognize. So, for any solar energy you generate that you can use at your home, mm -hmm. you still get the same <coughs> benefits as before, and the, the net metering two benefits. So, you know if you know if you're if you're running your air AC, you're charging your electric vehicle, your what have you, at two p.m. the solar generating, you're avoiding the full Bill, so you still get that. That is essentially the same as it ever was. It's just the exports. That's where batteries become so important. So what we really want to do is we want to say we want to use that sort of gravy, that extra money we have, to make it easier for the customer to put a battery on, because the battery is what allows them to actually retain much more of the value on the PG&E side of the bill. Because that's in the end what we want to do is we want to help customers. 
get bigger batteries so they can charge more of that solar uh, into that battery and then yeah, and really actually use it for their on-site consumption. I come home at four o'clock, come home at five o'clock, come home at six o'clock, turn the lights on. My heat pump starts to provide air conditioning or, or heating, my elect charging my electric vehicle, all of those, or just, you know, I'm home, my family's home, we're using more electricity. And so that's gonna actually allow people to capture way more of the overall benefit, offset more of their pg and &E bill. And so I think that's sort of our general mindset is, if we can make the batteries less expensive, it's actually gonna make solar way, even under solar billing tariff, we're gonna make this way more accessible to a lot of consumers and who can still look at this and say, great, with the AVA battery uh, capacity payment, suddenly going solar still allows me to save 10 or 15% of my bill. Great, if I can save 10 or 15% of my bill, I will invest in solar. Okay. So do we know how many residential and non-residential accounts have solar without battery backup? The vast majority today. We have about 60,000 uh, solar customers today, and I would say nearly all of them don't have battery backup. Today. Okay. I think we would look at this as available to retro. So if you have solar today, so the good thing is people who already have this are not going to get this new system applied to them retroactively. They still get the NEM1 or NEM2 treatment for 20 years. So after 20 years. That's grandfather. That's grandfather. Yeah. And so hopefully, you know, at the end of the 20 years, you know, it's paid for, right? So at that point, it's kind of free energy. So, um, but we will, whatever system we have, we will allow existing solar systems to benefit from our, our program to say, all right, you're getting close to 20 years. I now want to put a battery on connected to my existing solar system. We can do that, and then certainly for new ones. But if you're like beginning stages, first five years, it wouldn't make sense to add the battery at this point. No oh, I, it could. Yeah. It could make sense. I mean, it, 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 it's really going to be, we're going to be open. We're not, we're not going to limit this because the way we look at it is the battery, whether it's a, for a system that's already out there or a new system, the battery still has value because it's shifting the energy from being produced and used in the middle of the day to the later, latter part of the day when it's more valuable for us. New construction requires solar. Does yes. it require battery as well? Not. Just solar. Yes. Okay. So there's going to be a valuable. huge push from industry to add the battery. I, th I would expect so. And again, I think we're not, we're, the details are to be developed, but I think for us, a battery is a battery and a battery from a value perspective. When does this have to be implemented, this, this policy? What is our time? Yeah, when's an So um, it's live today. Yeah. Um, PG&E is able to start billing uh, NEM, uh, SVP customers uh, middle of December. So anyone that is rolling off of NEM 1.0 and they're going through their true process in, let's say, December, January, those customers would be transitioned to solar billing plan. I'd like to reduce customer confusion by having our system live at the same time. I, I, I will say, though, and this isn't an absolute number, but there was a huge, um, huge effort by the solar industry to sell a lot of solar in the first four months of this year for NEM3 to cut off. Yeah. And so our understanding is the vast majority of new solar systems that are being installed now and probably for at least the number, you know, for, oh, for, for, for yeah. quite some months yes. are going to be under NEM2, yeah. not NEM3. So yes. as we think yes. about, yes. As we think about yes. what, yes. what yes. we're implementing, right. the customer, whether we do it, in November or December or January or even February, right? Like over the course of the next handful of months, mm -hmm. the customers who are going to be impacted by us not having a final policy are really going to be this very small segment of people who installed solar in 2003 or yeah. earlier mm -hmm. who are now rolling. And if you saw in 2003, that was before financing for solar existed. So those people bought their systems yeah. cash. Small number. So, mm -hmm. yes, we want to do it from a customer experience perspective, but the really meaningful impact on large numbers of customers is still some ways off. Oh, yeah. 
And so that's why I think we say like, let's take our time. Let's make sure we get it up right. Especially, you know, with these battery capacity payments. Um, and what, even if we were to implement part of it now, the, the adders and say, we're going to give ourselves three months, four months, five months to get the capacity payments right. That's okay. Mm -hmm. Because people are, I think the solar industry is pretty busy installing their exact, their base yeah. and then figuring out kind of all the other stuff. Yeah. So it's not hugely disruptive from what we understand if we right. take a little bit of time. And, are you, and if we do that, we're only per se per month uh, foregoing, right? So at some point, whenever we do implement, let's say Q2 of, of 24, we'll just be from there on. It's not like they're uh, walking away from a huge amount. It's just an amount per month, per, per generation. Um, okay, so I'll disclose I'm an M1 customer uh, installed in 2009. I have, a, I think it's a six kilowatt or seven kilowatt system. And the darn thing was supposed to pay off in nine years and it paid off in like five because um, the rate stepped up immediately after I installed. So uh, I guess I'll ask it like this, and I apologize for the ignorance in it, but why are we not just offering a battery rebate? You know, if a battery costs, and I don't know what a battery costs, I haven't explored, but if a new battery system add-on costs a grand, why are we not doing a mail-in rebate for 300 bucks? Because it takes cash. So we could. We could do a rebate. I think the challenge that we run into is if we just do rebates, um, no, no teeth to stay there's on. There's no that. teeth to stay on peak load management. And the reason we're doing this is for peak load management. And so all things equal, I would rather, you know, I would rather set up a peak load management you know, payment plan that generates $500 of net present value payments over three years or five years, as opposed to doing $300 of net present value as a check today. So that we know, all right, these batteries they have a little bit of incentive to like do what they're supposed to do. Um, and they're sort of set up in that way to provide those benefits. And it's something we've observed, frankly, like with our Resilient Home Program. It's a program where we have 1,200 households that have home batteries that have signed up. Is that a lot of these batteries, when they're not forced to be in a sort of structure, they do kind of funky things with how they produce. Yeah. And that funky thing doesn't necessarily benefit the customer. It's just at time of install, no, you know, they're just not programmed in a way that is optimal for the grid. So we want these batteries to be programmed in a way that's going to be good for the grid. Certainly, as long we don't want that to sort of diminish the the, ration, the economic value to the consumer. Our view is that you can get both, and so we want to try to drive both. Uh, I, I know we have another item after this, but um, from where I stand, I like where everything you're going. Uh, I actually appreciate the response to that question because I think we should consider in light of the public comment at the beginning of local development or local, you know, we have a challenge here, right? We don't have the same sun capacity as the Mojave Desert or some of these other places in California, which is why it's harder to produce here in our uh, JPA area, right? So from my perspective, this is a low-hanging fruit opportunity to develop capacity, address load, and do it. So do I see potentially our budget allocating some of that local development resilient home dollars to a rebate on top of, you know, in the future, uh, or some other incentive, maybe an extra penny or, or half a penny on this? I think all of that uh, could play in, right? I think all of it could play in as we go forward. But I think uh, I'll touch on them three. I think it's wise to go with them three as our base and understand that while we didn't support it as an organization and I wasn't on the board at the time, but it is going to be the way California is moving. So I, I think it's easier for at least me to understand, okay, we're NEM three like the state and our adders actually enhanced. And so I look at it as customizing the adders for what EBCE or excuse me, Ava uh, does or needs or our customer base is what we could do to make it customized for our JPA area versus trying to, frankly, you know, come up with some other method that a solar installer would have to explain if we chose to try to do a NEM 2.0 Ava, right? And I just think uh, that's a big rock to push up the hill. Whereas if we adopt NEM 3, 
knowing we didn't support it, try to enhance it or, or adjust it, obviously, through the legal process or legislative process. But the adders are customized for the JPA area. I think that's how we do it. It gives us a chance to sort of establish our own. It's like, let's really make this our own now and, and it. make something that is really exciting for the customer. And that's, I think, what we're trying to get at. Um, but, but you could... I, Correct me if I'm wrong. You could see using, let's call it local development, of lo local resource. You know, you could see using local development dollars that 14 million that they mentioned at the beginning. If, if we so had it, this is a this is one way to in incentivize uh, doing solar and battery and, and whatnot in a different I, way. I, I I think that's exactly right. So when we're thinking about say those capacity payments, you could say, hey, you know, this is what we think it's worth. It's worth twenty five dollars a month, but let's add another twenty five dollars a month because we have Yep. Local development. So it's 50, you're getting $50 a month. Suddenly that's paying for the full battery. And we're happy to do that because, but you know, that's, that's where I think we have a flexible structure that allows us to sort of, hey, this is how much money we yeah. want to allocate to it. Let's drop it in there and we kind of manage that. And we're getting the thing that we want, which is batteries that provide peak management, resilience, clean energy. And then my last comment is the resilience is the big thing for Pleasanton because I see too many of these. Uh, natural gas uh, generators being installed, right? People go down to Costco and they'll see the, the Genentech generator being able to be their emergency backup. And with grid reliability uh, so challenging, right? I don't want to be burning that with a, you know, versus uh, having a battery backup. So the conversion and tracking, you know, targeting the customers like me on an M1 who need to, I probably, whenever my, um, Converter goes out is when I'm going to probably do it myself, right? So, you know, targeting customers that are at that point where they're nine years in. I'm sure you guys know when the peaks installs were, but okay. Uh, any other comments by any other members? Can Before we incentivize on? batteries for low income households? And that's actually the beauty of this yeah. structure is. Okay. is that we can say we might have a 2x multi, whatever it is, right? Care fair customers right. are going to have a higher level than non care fair. Yeah. You could even the geograph that's why like that's why we kind of like this where and it's simple to explain it's yeah. care fair you get 50 bucks non care fair you get 25 bucks <laughs> and so when someone's trying to like explain that when they're selling solar they're like oh okay that's and that's already much. that's already administered through a whole bunch of other ways we uh, do our thing anyway so help me understand how is this com <coughs> communicated to the solar installers yeah. like once we make this decision where's that that connection to so make sure I, the public I is think, getting you know, we, accurate information sure i mean i think we work with the trade association we do trainings on how it works the, so there are two or three software packages that the solar industry by and large uses okay and so part, what part of what we will do is literally like sit down with them and walk through how to tune their soft their sales software okay. so that their so sales software is reflecting way. what Ava is doing. Okay. And then once it's in the sales software, kind of like every, yeah. the yeah. people at, you know, knocking on the door or calling you will say, okay, Ava customer would hit that button and then it just sort of flows through. And, and theoretically, if Ava uh, had windfall profits in the future or something, or windfall, I shouldn't say that because we're a public agency. <laughs> so if the Ava had a significant surplus, it could, it could, uh, Increase the, the benefit rates and similar, like every year we publish our correct. rates or yeah, whatever. Yeah. And do we want to do that? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So when would we reassess this once we decide? I think they're saying Q1, they'll join. bring back a... Yeah. So I think what we would do is... But we, after implementation, how far out? When would we five do years. Five, five years look back? Okay. Yeah. Five years and then obviously on an annual basis, we probably have yeah. the ability, depending on our budget situation, we said, hey, let's do so, sort of a one-time thing. Mm -hmm. We have that ability, but probably five years just so we yeah. can kind of see some longevity. Mm -hmm. And then how does this um, impact San Joaquin Valley? Same this would concept, be applied there. Yeah. Same, yeah. everything yeah. within Any our GPA. Custom, any yeah. of a customer would have that kind of benefits. Okay. Any other questions by any other members? All right. We'll be closing this item and moving on. Thank you very much. Really appreciate the presentation Thanks. and the time. Uh, okay. So with that, we're going to move to closed session. And Adrian, I apologize. You sent an email about how we're going to do that now, but do you mind reminding us? Uh, we will um, uh, adjourn to a, um, a, a conference room on the 18th floor. Okay. So with that, we're joining the closed session, and we will be back to report out. Yes. And appreciate your time. Uh, your space. All right. So we'll do great. I'm going to mute this, Adrian. Yeah.
did it go? It's still gone. Um, I, it's fine. No one's on the line. They're in closed session right now. Oh, okay. okay. So I have to keep the open session open. But, uh, but you know, it's gone. No worries. Okay. Should I move this? Yeah. Okay, great. We will, are we ready to resume the meeting so I can report out, please? Adrian, we also realized we needed to take public comment on it, so we're going to do that real fast probably, though, but we lost quorum, so let's not quorum. Okay. Yeah. Um, just... okay. We're back. Okay, so uh, we are out of closed session. Uh, we realized that we did not take public comment on closed session, so I just want to make sure I open that up now, and we will... Uh, do that at this time. Is there anyone that would like to speak on closed session item? There are no hands raised for okay. uh, this item. Closed, and therefore we will move to reporting out. There is no reportable action from closed session, and meeting is now adjourned. Awesome. Thank you.